Ave Maria, and welcome to the History Programme, a monthly series of programmes produced by the Franciscans of the Immaculate for Gate of Heaven Radio. In this series, we will be looking at events in history, famous people in history, including saints and blesseds, foundations of religious orders, and much more. In short, anything in history that has a Catholic perspective. Our objective will be to tell you the facts as recorded by history. We will not be entering into polemics, nor aiming to generate any controversy. If we venture an opinion, we will say so. You are free to agree or disagree. This month's programme is entitled Rochester's Divine Prelate, St John Fisher. The English city of Rochester is located in Kent, not that far from London. Nowadays, Rochester is famous for its connections with Charles Dickens, the great 19th century novelist, who based many of his novels on the area. However, Rochester is, above all, a cathedral city. In fact, it is the second oldest see in England having been established by St. Augustine of Canterbury himself. The present-day cathedral dates from the 12th century and lies beside the ruins of Rochester Castle. Both edifices were built by the monk Gondolf. It is the cathedral that is the important connection to our story tonight, as we look at the holy life and death of one of its most illustrious bishops. Nowadays, this cathedral, like so many other medieval cathedrals in England, is used as a Protestant Anglican cathedral. Nevertheless, the choir screen in the cathedral does have a statue of our Catholic bishop. The bishop's name is St. John Fisher, and this is his story. John Fisher was born in Beverley, in Yorkshire, in 1468 or 1469. This was a time in English history when England was being torn apart by the War of the Roses. This war was being fought over rival claims to the throne of England. We do not have enough time in this programme to discuss this war in any detail. Suffice to say that the end result was that Henry Tudor was put on the throne as King Henry VII, and this marked the beginning of the House of Tudor dynasty. It is probably unnecessary to say that Henry VII was the father of the infamous King Henry VIII. Young John Fisher had a good Catholic upbringing and was a pious lad. He proved to be a good scholar at school, and at the age of 14 years, he left for Cambridge University. John had already spent two years at university when the War of the Roses ended on the field of Bosworth and the course of English history would be changed forever. John proved his excellence in the academic field, earning his Bachelor of Arts degree at 18 years and his Master's at 22 years. Not long afterwards, he was elected a fellow of his college. It is most likely that John had his mind set on becoming a priest since his school days. Noel MacDonald Wilby, in his biography, The Story of Blessed John Fisher, tells us that it is difficult to ascertain the exact date of his ordination, but his biographer says he must have been ordained priest on the title of his fellowship. In 1494, he was chosen as senior proctor. His proctorial duties took him to the court, and it was there that he first encountered Lady Margaret Beaufort, the king's mother. Honours continued in 1497, when he was elected master of his college. In 1501, he received his doctorate, and a few days later he was appointed Vice-Chancellor of the University. 
he was still only 32 years of age. It was not just Father Fisher's reputation for learning that was growing, so was his reputation for holiness. In 1502, Lady Margaret Beaufort appointed him as her confessor. It was about this time that Father Fisher resigned his mastership of the college. Lady Margaret had as much a reputation for learning and holiness as her saintly confessor. She heard several masses daily and had a deep devotion to the Blessed Sacrament and the Blessed Virgin Mary. As Father Fisher himself said of her, though she chose me as her director to hear her confessions and to guide her life, yet I gladly confess that I learnt more from her great virtue than I could teach to her. Under the guidance of Father Fisher, Lady Margaret was to prove a generous benefactress to Cambridge University. In 1504, Father Fisher was elected Chancellor of Cambridge University, an office which he was destined to fill for the rest of his life. In that same year, 1504, Lady Margaret received a letter from her royal son in which he stated his intention to appoint Father Fisher to a bishopric. In the letter, the King wrote that, I am well minded to promote Master Fisher, your confessor, to a bishopric. And I assure you, Madam, for none other cause but for the great and singular virtue that I know and see in him. And by the promotion of such a man, I know well it should encourage many others to live virtuously. John Fisher was appointed to the See of Rochester. He was consecrated by the Archbishop of Canterbury on the 24th of November, 1504. At that time, Rochester was both the smallest and the poorest see in England. Bishop Fisher was to remain there for 31 years. In fact, he refused to go to a bigger and richer see, saying, that he would not desert his poor old wife for the richest widow in England. Bishop Fisher took a great interest in the state of his clergy. He also had a tender devotion to the poor and the sick, with whom he would spend much time and leave alms with him when he left. As regards the dying, he would prepare them for a good death. Every day he gave alms to the poor who called to his palace, and he himself would oversee the just distribution of these alms. Bishop Fisher would spend most of his leisure time in his library, which housed one of the best private collections of books in the country. We need hardly state that Bishop Fisher practised all the virtues and was a shining example to all who knew him. Henry's cousin, Reginald Pole, once said of Bishop Fisher, If search were to be made through every corner of Christendom in this our age, it would not be easy to find another such perfect bishop as he. In fact, all over Europe, Bishop Fisher was known as the Divine Prelate. As we have already said, Bishop Fisher continued in his role as Chancellor of Cambridge University. Thanks to the generosity of Lady Margaret, two new colleges came into being. One, Christ's College, was founded during her lifetime, so named because of her singular devotion to the name of Jesus Christ. The other, St. John's College, would be established only after her death. Above all, Bishop Fisher saw Cambridge as a training ground for the priesthood, especially as most of the colleges were designed for the study of theology. 
Remember, this was over four decades prior to the Council of Trent, which established seminaries as we know them today. He wished to increase the standard of priestly education, especially in the art of preaching, and to guide men on the way to becoming holy priests. As Mr. MacDonald Wilby tells us in his book, Bishop Fisher was wont to say, In the days of the Apostles there were no chalices of gold, but many golden priests. Now there be many chalices of gold, but almost no golden priests. In 1509, King Henry VII died, and Bishop Fisher was chosen to preach the funeral sermon. Whatever your view is on the claim of the Tudors to the throne of England, at least we can say that Henry died a good death. Indeed, as Mr MacDonald Wilby confirms for us, Henry was the last English king to die in the faith for many long years. Just a couple of months after Henry's death, his mother, Lady Margaret, went on to her eternal reward. Bishop Fisher would also preach the funeral sermon of this saintly woman. The plans for the establishment of St John's College in Cambridge had begun during the lifetime of Lady Margaret, but she died before all the legal necessities could be completed. It would take many years for this college to be built, entailing as it did a long legal struggle with opponents to the plan. The struggle involved papal bulls and Bishop Fisher's first public contest with King Henry VIII. However, at the end of the day, thanks to the Trojan efforts of the bishop, the college was completed. It is interesting to note that a future student at this college would be Philip Howard, Earl of Arundel, who died for the fate in 1595. He was canonised in 1970 as one of the 40 martyrs of England and Wales. When we examine the life and labours of Bishop Fisher, we have to conclude that he must have been something of a natural genius. We have already given a short account of his work at Cambridge and his labours in Rochester as shepherd of the diocese. He also had a reputation for being a brilliant preacher and writer, and these gifts came to the fore with the advent of a new heresy originated by Martin Luther in Germany and now making inroads into England. On one famous occasion in 1521, he preached the sermon at St Paul's Cross in London when books written by Luther and other heretics were publicly burnt. His written theological works are too numerous to list in full, but include a defence of the assertions of the King of England against Luther's Babylonian captivity, which was written against Luther's, Luther's reply to Henry VIII's book in defence of the seven sacraments, and defence of the sacred priesthood against Luther, and commentary on the seven penitential psalms. His books earned the praise of such noted Catholic humanists as Erasmus and Sir Thomas More. However, Bishop Fisher knew that prayer was the foundation for all good works. Indeed, he once remarked, in answer to praise for his campaign against the Lutherans, that he wished that time of writing had been spent in prayer, thinking that prayer would have done more good and was of more merit. Henry VII had been succeeded by his son Henry, who became King Henry VIII. It is almost forgotten today that Henry VIII was a very intelligent man, well versed in theology and Latin. In fact, if he had not got married, he may well have been destined for the priesthood. 
he actually did write a book in defense of the seven sacraments against the Lutheran heresy, which earned for him the papal title Defender of the Faith. Reginald Pohl relates that whilst Henry's grandmother, Lady Beaufort, was on her deathbed, she entreated Bishop Fisher to assist her grandson with instruction and advice. And then, looking at her grandson, she asked him to defer to the bishop in preference to all others. It was good advice, but Henry did not heed it. As we know, Henry gave himself up to his passions, especially lust and a luxurious lifestyle. In contrast, Henry's wife, Queen Catherine of Aragon, was a saintly soul. It goes without saying that God puts a husband and wife together so that they can help each other get to heaven. If only Henry had listened to his good wife, how different the course of his life and English history would have been. We will not go into the details of Henry's vicious life in this programme. The sordid facts are already well documented elsewhere. Suffice to say that Henry became involved with one of the ladies at court, Anne Boleyn by name, and she had ambitions to become queen. Catherine of Aragon had been married to Henry's brother Arthur, but the latter died young. Catherine was later given to Henry in marriage after the necessary papal dispensation had been granted. Henry now claimed that he had a scruple about his marriage with Catherine, claiming that the marriage was not valid, as the Pope, in his opinion, could not grant a dispensation in such cases, and that this was why he still had no male heir, so he claimed. He wanted the Pope to annul his marriage with Catherine. By the way, recent authors have consistently written that it was a divorce that was being sought by Henry, but of course such a thing did not exist in Christendom. The correct word to use is declaration of nullity. Henry's scheme to get his marriage annulled came to the fore in 1527, with his sounding out of theologians, including Bishop Fisher, for their opinion on this, what Henry called the king's great matter. It was probably around this time that the Queen herself first heard rumours of the scheme. The King was duly assisted by his Chancellor, Cardinal Wolsey, in his Machiavellian tactics to trying, in trying to win over the bishops, and ultimately the Holy Father, into having the original dispensation ruled invalid, and so the marriage annulled. Suffice to say that Bishop Fisher would not be bullied but rather he affirmed the Pope's right to dispense in cases such as this. During all these proceedings, it has to be said that Henry's treatment of his good wife, Catherine, was despicable. The Queen was anxious to gain the counsel of Bishop Fisher, but Henry did all he could to prevent this. In contrast to Henry's behaviour, Catherine's heroic virtue shines throughout. Her cause for canonization is proceeding, and the Church has already proclaimed her venerable. During my assignment in England, I was very blessed to be able to visit and pray at her tomb in Peterborough Cathedral. In 1529, the matter came before a legatine court, which sat in England in the presence of the papal legate Cardinal Campeggio. The Queen attended in person, but not Henry. Bishop Fisher was present in court to defend the rights of the Queen. We have Cardinal Campeggio's written account regarding Bishop Fisher's appearance and his testimony. The Bishop's directness of speech startled the whole assembly and enraged the King. Cardinal Campeggio reports the prophetic words spoken by Bishop Fisher. 
In order not to procure the damnation of his own soul, and in order not to be unfaithful to the king, or to fail in doing the duty which he owed to the truth, in a matter of such great importance, Bishop Fisher offered to declare, to affirm, and with forcible reasons to demonstrate to them that this marriage of the king and queen can be dissolved by no power, human or divine. And for this opinion, he declared that he would even lay down his own life. He added that John the Baptist in olden times regarded it as impossible for him to die more gloriously than in the cause of marriage and that as it was not so holy at that time as it has become by the shedding of Christ's blood, he, the bishop, could encourage himself more ardently, more effectually, and with greater confidence to dare any great or extreme peril whatever. In July of the same year, 1529, the Pope revoked the legatine powers and reserved the case to himself, Henry, in his rage, dismissed Wolsey as Chancellor and replaced him with Sir Thomas More. Wolsey died a miserable death about a year later. In his fury against their opposition to his scheme against the Queen, Henry began to vent his revenge on the clergy, using Parliament for the purpose of enacting laws restricting the rights of the Church. In the ensuing persecution, Bishop Fisher was briefly detained. The king was anxious to control the clergy. By 1531, he was demanding that Parliament should declare him head of the church in England, and that the clergy should swear an oath to this effect. Seeing that the clergy would give way through fear, Bishop Fisher advised him to include the saving clause so far as the law of God permits. It was around this time that two attempts were made against Bishop Fisher's life, and the suspect in the second attempt was the father of Anne Boleyn. In May 1532, Moore resigned from the Chancellorship. Events began to take a turn for the worse with the death of the Archbishop of Canterbury and his replacement with Thomas Cranmer. Cranmer proved to be the perfect disciple of his master Henry and was like him in both character and action. Another act of parliament was passed despite opposition from Bishop Fisher, this time prohibiting appeals to Rome in certain legislative matters. In January 1533, Henry went through a form of marriage with Anne Boleyn, who was already expecting. Cranmer having previously issued a legal declaration that Henry's marriage with Catherine had been null. Cranmer had no right to do this, as the case had already been referred to Rome for judgment. Shortly afterwards, Parliament declared Henry's marriage with Catherine null, and in June Anne Boleyn was crowned Queen. This was the fulfilment of her great desire. However, as it turned out, she would not be queen for very long. Bishop Fisher continued to defend Catherine, and in April had been imprisoned for a couple of months. He was already old and frail, and illness was beginning to take its toll. Of course, the only legitimate authority on the matter of the marriage was the Pope, and he quickly annulled Cranmer's proceedings. And in March 1534, the Pope finally decreed the validity of Henry's marriage to Catherine. To everyone, it should have been clear that Rome has spoken, the case is closed. But Henry, a slave to his own passions, was not to be moved. The King's persecution of Bishop Fisher continued unabated. The Bishop was called upon to swear the oath of succession, which followed on from the act of succession. 
the Act legitimised the issue of Henry and Anne Boleyn and made provision for the swearing of an oath to this effect. However, in practice the oath could go further than this and, in fact, it did on many occasions. We do not know the form of the oath asked of Bishop Fisher, but he wanted to qualify it before swearing. It is likely that the oath included a clause against the authority of the Pope. In any case, Bishop Fisher refused to swear it. The Holy Bishop was immediately sent to the Tower of London, shortly to be joined by Sir Thomas More for the same reason. The bishop's goods were confiscated and his library was ransacked. He suffered terribly in the tower, especially as his health was ailing fast, but his friends remembered him and brought him food. In prison, he was again asked to swear the oath of succession. He said he would swear the succession, but nothing else that went against his conscience. His sufferings increased greatly when he heard that his own sister, a Dominican nun, and the clergy of his diocese had succumbed and sworn the oath. In November 1534, Parliament declared Henry to be the supreme head of the Church in England. Anyone could now be called upon to take an oath to this effect, and refusal to do so was treason. This is usually taken as Henry's official break with Rome. In May 1535, Bishop Fisher saw the three Carthusian monks pass by his window at the tower on their way to martyrdom for refusing this oath of supremacy. Also that same month, Pope Paul III called a consistory and gave the red hat to Bishop Fisher for defending the dogma of the divine origin of the papacy. When the news reached Henry, he sarcastically boasted that Cardinal Fisher would wear the red hat on his shoulders because he would have no head on which to set it. It should be said that the Pope tried by all means to secure the release of his new cardinal. As an aside, we should mention that another virtuous and learned Englishman of the time was also honoured with the red hat at the same consistory. Henry's cousin, Reginald Pole, who was destined to become the last Catholic Archbishop of Canterbury. Both Cardinal Fisher and Moore were now called upon to swear the oath of supremacy or they would be executed before St. John's Day. Both refused, of course. It is sad to recall that Cardinal Fisher was the only English bishop who refused to take the oath. The Cardinal was taken to Westminster Hall for trial. We do not have time to go into details of the trial, but suffice to say that the honesty of the Cardinal shone throughout in contrast to the lies and misrepresentation of, of Henry and his cohorts. Even the jury were cowed into bringing in a guilty verdict. The frail and ailing cardinal was taken back to the tower to await his execution. The usual barbarous sentence of being hanged, drawn and quartered was eventually altered to beheading. This was not due to clemency on Henry's part, but rather because it was thought that the Cardinal would have died on the way to Tyburn. On the day of his execution, the Cardinal had to be carried all the way to the Tower Gate. He insisted on walking the rest of the way himself. When he reached the scaffold, the executioner knelt down before him to ask his pardon, as was the custom. Then the Cardinal addressed the crowd in a moving final farewell. Christian people, I am come hither to die for the faith of Christ's holy Catholic Church, and I thank God hitherto my stomach 
had served me very well thereunto, so that yet I have not feared death. Wherefore, I do deserve you all to help and assist me with your prayers, that at the very point and instant of death's stroke, I may, in that very moment, stand steadfast, without fainting in any one point of the Catholic faith, free from any fear. And I beseech Almighty God of his infinite goodness to save the King and this realm, and that it may please him to hold his holy hand over it, and send the king good counsel. After the recitation of some prayers, the cardinal raised his hands and then bowed to lay his head on the block. His head was severed at one blow. It was the 22nd of June, 1535. His severed head was later set up on a pole over London Bridge. Two weeks later, Sir Thomas More followed him on the same way to a glorious martyrdom. The two deaths shocked all of Europe. As the historian Hilaire Belloc puts it, both were men of the highest European reputation, great humanist scholars, especially More, and their executions raised a loud and angry protest throughout Christendom. Both Cardinal Fisher and Sir Thomas More were canonised in 1935 by Pope Pius XI. If we look at the lives of the major figures in all of this, what do we find? We can say that Anne Boleyn's lifestyle became as base as Henry's. She would not remain queen for much longer. Her life ended with the blow of the Executioner's Axe in 1536. Henry himself would live until 1547, becoming so grotesque and immoral that it does not bear description. His death is one of the most terrible deaths in history. The wretched Thomas Cranmer was burnt as a heretic in 1556. Those three deaths are in stark contrast to the holy deaths of Queen Catherine, Cardinal Fisher, and Sir Thomas More. The illustrious memory of St John Fisher still shone in Europe during the decades to come. That great Archbishop of Milan and champion of the Counter-Reformation, St Charles Borromeo, is said to have displayed just two portraits in his study, St Ambrose and the martyred Bishop of Rochester. This episode of the History Programme was researched and presented by Frost Solanus for Gate of Heaven Radio. We hope you have enjoyed it. A recording of it can be found on our websites Aus Maria and Er Maria. That is www.ausmaria.com and www.aior.com maria.com Ave Maria